Okay, again, welcome to our Wednesday night small group. For the last four weeks, this will be week number five, we have been looking at a study of the 12 apostles. The primary source for all of the charts that you have been doing is the 12 Disciples Bible Study, which is a Rose Visual Bible Study. And then the sheets that you've been filling out, most of that information comes from the book 12 Ordinary Men by John MacArthur. We will finish up Philip and Nathaniel today, and then next week, hopefully, we'll get the other four. Uh, as we've talked before, as we go through the apostles, we know less and less and less about them. So we'll try to get through, we'll get through Philip and Nathaniel tonight. Next week, we'll try to get through the last four. If we don't, it'll lap over into the next week, and we'll just be later starting the, the other study. The study after this one, we're going to be looking at the letters to the seven churches of Revelation. So that's what we're going to be doing from about mid-October through December, possibly even into January. I'm not sure with some of the special programs going on on Wednesday nights, I'm not sure how that's going to work out. So we will see. We'll play it by ear and get through it. So in session one for the study, we looked at how Jesus called and trained the 12 men who would be called the apostles. And if you'll remember, we talked about the distinction between disciple and apostle. Disciple simply means a student or a learner. Apostle means someone who was sent. And traditionally, to be called an apostle in the New Testament, it means you, number one, saw Jesus alive, and number two, you were sent by him on a ministry. So the original 12 apostles also Jesus alive, and they were sent on ministry trips. Apostle Paul saw Jesus alive and was sent as a minister to the Gentiles. So that's the definition of an apostle. And basically what an apostle was was an ambassador. When he spoke, he spoke with the authority of whoever sent him. So when the apostles spoke, they spoke with the authority of Jesus. And that was important because if you look at who wrote the New Testament scriptures, Every one of them was either an apostle or somebody who was closely related to an apostle. In session two, we started looking at the different apostles. In session number two, we looked at the first of two sets of fishermen brothers. That was Peter and Andrew. And if you remember, Peter came across in the scripture as the more forceful, the more leader-oriented uh, of the two. On the other side, his brother Andrew came across as the more resourceful, connector type person. Peter would become the leader of the disciples and would become one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem after Christ's ascension. Andrew would be the one who would bring people to Jesus. We talked a little bit about that uh, when we talked about the two of them. In session number three, we talked about the other fishermen brothers, which were James and John. James and John, if you'll remember, were commercial fishermen, just like Peter and Andrew. And as near as we can tell, most Bible scholars agree that the four of them were in the fishing business together. Uh, Jesus identified the brothers as the sons of thunder because they were very passionate about things. And if you'll remember, we talked about some of the episodes where they're mentioned in the Bible where they were extremely passionate about things to the point of being legalistic about it. And if you remember, Jesus said, you've got to temper your passion with love. So when they said, we want to call down fire from heaven on that Samaritan village that refused them entrance, Jesus said, no, that's not what we're here for. So for those two, very passionate, but needed to learn some compassion as well. Last week, session four, we started looking at some of the lesser known apostles. And in this case, last time we looked at Matthew or Levi and Thomas. And Matthew was probably the most unexpected apostle because Matthew was a tax collector. And he was basically a societal outcast. He was cast out of the synagogue because he was a collaborator with the Roman government. Probably family didn't have anything to do with him. He had no friends other than 
people like him who worked for the Roman government. He also doesn't appear but three times in Scripture. We see his call. We see the banquet that he set for Jesus with his friends right after he was called. And then we see him um, listed in all the lists of the apostles. So three times he's mentioned. His calling, the banquet he's through, and he's always in the list. Uh, Thomas, on the other hand, was called the twin. And you'll remember, we don't really know who the twin is. It's never really uh, mentioned who his twin was or what kind of twin it was. Again, in the Synoptic Gospels, Thomas is only mentioned in the lists. Everything that we know about Thomas comes from the book of John. And we're going to find in the case of the two apostles tonight that, again, most of what we know about them come from the writings of the Apostle John. They're listed in the Synoptic Gospels in the lists, but they don't tell us much more than that. Um, Thomas is mentioned three times, too. He's mentioned after Lazarus dies, when Jesus sets his face to go back to see the sisters, and he says to the other apostles, let's go with him, even if we're going to die. And then when Jesus in the upper room says, I'm going away, Thomas says, where are you going? And then thirdly, what we remember him for is the fact that he was not there when Jesus originally appeared to the apostles and the disciples in the upper room <coughs> after the resurrection. And he said, I have to touch his scars before I believe it was him. And as I mentioned last week, we call him doubting, but there were other people who doubted too. John the Baptist doubted. <coughs> there were other disciples that are mentioned as being doubting. But somehow or other, Thomas is the one who gets the bad rap. What we sometimes forget is after seeing Jesus, he came out with his profession of faith, my Lord and my God, which became almost the touchstone for the early church. That was their profession of faith. If you will, the earliest creed, and I'm not sure creed's the right word for it, but the earliest statement of faith was what Thomas said. So tonight, we're going to look at Philip and Bartholomew. Again, oh, we don't know a whole heck of a lot about them. Most of what we know comes from tradition. There is a little in Scripture, but again, not much. In fact, if you look at the title on it, I've said that they are men of few words because they didn't say a whole lot. They are mentioned several times doing certain things, but very few places, and I can't think of any right off the top of my head, where they actually said something, had an interchange with, with Jesus. So let's start with the Apostle Philip. If you go back to session number two, you got your sheets with you, go back to session number two. You remember the first thing we did in session number two was to look at the division of the uh, apostles, how they were grouped in groups of four. If you look at that list, in every list of the apostles, Philip is mentioned fifth. He's always the first one in the second group. He's always mentioned in number five. He's mentioned as the first one in the second group. And generally speaking, each person who heads up one of the three groups, most Bible scholars believe that meant they were kind of the one in charge, if you will, of that group. And each group were closer in intimacy with Jesus. So the first four were the inner circle, then you've got Philip in the second group, and when you get to the third group, you got people who were there, but we don't know a lot about them. That's the ones we're going to be talking about next week. What we do know about Philip is that his name is Greek. So when they talk about Philip in the in New Testament, they use his Greek name. We suspect, or we would expect, he had a Jewish name. But nowhere does it tell us what his Jewish name was. It simply calls him Philip, and that's what he's known by. Uh, it did make one point in 
MacArthur's book, when you think about the eunuch on the road to um, Egypt, or I forget where he was going, to the temple, I think, maybe, the eunuch on the road where Peter. Philip meets him, mm -hmm. that's the not this Philip. That is actually Philip the deacon in Acts that actually is the one who meets the eunuch on the road. Uh, Philip the evangelist, one of the deacons, not Philip the apostle. And a lot of times those two are confused. But MacArthur makes a point of saying, keep them apart. It's two different Philips. What we do know about the apostle Philip is that he was uh, born and lived in the town of Bethsaida, which if you remember our study of Mark on Sunday mornings, Bethsaida is on the Sea of Galilee, up at the top of the Sea of Galilee, and it's also the hometown of Philip and Andrew. So there is some inference by some writers that Philip probably grew up with and knew Philip and Andrew because they were from the same hometown. And there is some evidence that Philip was possibly a fisherman, like Philip and Andrew. It's not definite. It's not stated in Scripture. It's an inference that is drawn by some of the biblical scholars. Now, when we look at the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all they do is list Philip in the listing. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us nothing else. He's one of the apostles. He's number five. Everything else that we know about him comes from the book of John. Everything else that we know about the apostle Philip comes from the book of John. Usually, when you see Philip mentioned, you will see Nathaniel mentioned as well. So again, the inference is that Philip and Nathaniel or in fact, good friends. And if you remember, Philip is the one who goes and gets Nathaniel and brings him to Jesus. So again, the inference is Philip and Nathaniel were good friends. When they're mentioned in John, they're usually mentioned together. Now, what we see when we look at Philip from the few places where he's mentioned is Philip was a very practical by the book um, individual. He wanted things done in the right procedure, the right protocol, the right way. He was practical, detail-oriented, by the book. And you can see that if you look in John and we see the story of the feeding of the 5,000. So look in John chapter 6. I didn't bring it tonight. John chapter 6, beginning at verse 4, and we have the feeding of the 5,000. And in the home when it says, Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. Therefore, when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming towards him, he asked Philip, Where do we buy bread so these people can eat? So who did he ask for the logistics of feeding all these people? Philip. He asked Philip. Which leads, again, some Bible scholars to infer that Philip was like the logistician, the supply guy for the disciples. He was the one responsible for getting food and lodging and this kind of stuff. The practical things that you need for a group of men to go around and, and minister... And his practicality comes forward as you keep reading. So look at verse 6. It says, He, being Jesus, asked this to test him, Philip, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. So very practical-minded. we got 5,000 people here, not counting women and children. 5,000 men, not counting women and children. We have next to nothing in the way of money that we can use to spend to feed them. I'm very practical, and I don't see a solution to this problem. Now, remember, before this, G 
Jesus has already fed people. He's already healed people. He's already done miracles. But Philip is stuck on the practicality of how do you feed 10, 15,000 people when you don't have the money and you don't have the resources to do it. So he was probably the logistician, but he was very practical about how he went about his job. Philip is the fourth called to be a disciple. Philip is the fourth to be called by Jesus to be a disciple. Who were the first three? Andrew, Peter, Andrew, and John. Peter, and John. Andrew, Peter, and John. That's probably on your sheet, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> no. Oh, well, no, I'm glad somebody's looking at my sheet. Answer, so we just did. So, do you remember John the Baptist pointed Andrew and we think John were the, the two disciples that John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and then Andrew went and got Peter. So from there, Jesus went and looked for Philip so that he would be the fourth. But his calling was different. John the Baptist pointed Andrew, John, and Peter to Jesus. Jesus went looking for Philip. He sought Philip out. And when he got to Philip, it was evident from Philip's response. If you look at John chapter 1, verse 45, it's evident from his response that Philip knew the scriptures and recognized that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies for the Messiah. And what does he do immediately thereafter? What does Philip do immediately after Calling, being called by Jesus. No, he goes and gets Bartholomew or Nathaniel. He goes and gets his friend, which again leads us to believe that Nathaniel and Philip were close friends. Just like Andrew went to get his brother Peter, Philip goes to get his friend Nathaniel. So after his calling, that's one place we see Philip. The second place we see Philip is in the feeding of the 5,000, which I read part of just now. Jesus knew how he was going to feed the crowd, but he did it as a test to see if Philip understood his ability to do the miraculous. The third time we see Philip is at Passover, during Passion Week. And if you'll remember the story when we were doing John, a group of Greeks came to Philip and said we would see Jesus. And we discussed back then, why did they come to Philip? Well, his name is Greek. That would maybe be a hint that they felt a kinship with him since he had a Greek name. He was also from Bethsaida, which was an area just to the south of the Decapolis, which was a Greek-oriented region of the country. And maybe they realized that he was the one who did the logistics for the group, and therefore maybe the best person to talk to about getting access to Jesus. And that's Philip? That's Philip. Now, again, Philip's practicality comes through. Here's some Greeks coming up saying, we want to see Jesus. There's no precedence for this. Who has Jesus been ministering to up until this point? The Jews. The Jews. He's been predominantly visiting and ministering to the Jews. Now, we know that he did from last week's lesson and Sunday morning. We know that he went up into the Gentile region and came back down. But predominantly, he's been ministering to the Jewish nation, preaching that the kingdom of God was coming. But now... Here are Gentiles coming to me saying, we want to see Jesus. Now, I don't know why Philip doesn't think back to their trip around the Gentile region earlier, but he evidently doesn't. So he doesn't see a precedent. How do I get these Gentiles to Jesus? So what does he do? He takes them to who was the connector 
Andrew. He takes them to Andrew. Andrew was the connector. He'll know what to do. And then the last time we see Philip is in the upper room during the Last Supper. Jesus has talked about, you know, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again, uh, I'm going to heaven. And Philip doesn't understand the meanings of all this. And he asked Jesus to show us the Father. And Jesus' answer is, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Up until this point, Jesus was uh, Philip was fine with the understanding that Jesus was the Messiah. He knew that from the minute that Jesus called him. What he had not yet understood is not only was he the Messiah, he was also, in fact, God himself. So he had accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Now he had to accept him as God the Son. And that's the last time we see Philip in Scripture. Four places. So what do we know about Philip from tradition? So if you've got your sheets, you should have a biography sheet for Philip in there. So let's go through and fill up the biography sheet. And some of this I've talked about. Other things, like I say, are tradition. And we'll fill them in as tradition. So biography of Philip, names. Of course, we know of he only had one name, and that was Philip, which was a Greek name. It, in fact, means in Greek, he who loves horses. Now, if Philip was a fisherman, I'm not sure why horses have to do with anything here. But his name means one who loves horses. Under personal information, we know that he was born in Bethsaida. Bethsaida is B-E-T-H-S-A-I-D-A. -E That's in John 1.44. He was born in Bethsaida. The second thing that we know about him is he understood scripture. He was well versed in scripture. Again, John 1, 45 and 46. Because he talks with Jesus about fulfilling scripture when he's called. Did you say John 1, 46? 1, 45 through 46. He may have been fluent in Greek. Why? because the Greeks came to him asking to see Jesus in John 12. So he may have known the Greek language. That may have been the reason they came to him. And again, as I mentioned earlier, don't confuse him with Philip the Evangelist. Philip the Evangelist, the story of the Enoch on the road, is the deacon Philip, not the apostle Philip. So keep the two of them straight. Under spiritual information. Oh, that was all under personal? That's all under personal. Well, I spread it out. <laughs> oh, spiritual information, he was the fourth disciple who Jesus called. Andrew, Peter, John were the first three. Philip was the fourth. Andrew, John, Philip. Oh. Okay. Peter. <laughs> in John 1, after he was called by Jesus, he brought Nathaniel or Bartholomew to Jesus. I'm going to talk about Nathaniel and Bartholomew here in a minute. So he took his best friend, just like Andrew went and got his brother, Philip went and got his best friend, Nathaniel. Is this spiritual? This is still under spiritual. Say that again, would you? Uh, he brought Nathaniel. Or Bartholomew okay. to Jesus, his best friend. Okay. Still under spiritual. Sometimes he got confused listening to what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. So, the upper room, Jesus talks about going to heaven. Philip asked to see the Father. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Sometimes Philip took a little extra help to figure out what was going on. 
not too much unlike many of us. <laughs> and then lastly under spiritual, he took the Greeks that came looking for Jesus to Andrew who took them to Jesus. Let's go over that again. He took the Greeks who came to Jesus. He, he took the Greeks who came wanting to see Jesus to Andrew who took them to Jesus. Okay, under historical information. We're still writing. Okay, sorry. Slow me down. He took them to, he took them to where? To, he took the Greeks yeah. to Andrew who took to them Andrew. to okay. Jesus. So he was the... He was the starting point to take them to Andrew, who was the connector who took them to Jesus. Don't get confused. Okay, historical information. Tradition says that he lived and preached in what is today the Ukraine. Tradition says that he lived and preached in the area that we know today as the Ukraine. So, North Central Europe. Well, no, and this is, is that where Beth, Bethsaida is? No, Bethsaida is down on the okay, Sea of Galilee. so this wasn't where he was born. This no, is where he no, lived. this is okay. where he said, after Jesus left and the disciples all scattered, he, out, he, yeah. went to the he okay. is believed to have gone to the Ukraine where he lived and preached. Hmm. But he came back to Turkey because it's believed that's where he was martyred. Tradition says that he was crucified on a tall cross. And not a cross like Jesus, but a T-cross. You've seen the pictures of Jesus, you know, the, the upward beam, the, there's a piece above the cross beam. With Tradition says that Philip was crucified on a cross that was basically a T. And for that reason, a T-shaped cross is one of his symbols. A T-shaped cross is one of his symbols. Again, this is tradition. You know, all of these people who were martyred, we don't really know what happened other than what tradition tells us. And the other thing that is a symbol for Philip are loaves of bread. Jesus asked, how are we going to feed these 5,000 men plus women and children? Well, we got these loaves and fish. So, the loaves of bread is a symbol for Philip. So loaves of bread, T-shaped cross. Oh, I put that in the wrong place too. Okay, what about Nathaniel? Well, as I said before, Nathaniel was probably Philip's best friend. When Philip is uh, sought by Jesus, the first thing he does is go to get Nathaniel and say, Nathaniel, come see, we have found the Messiah. Now, in each of the synoptic gospels and in the book of Acts, his name is listed as Nathaniel. John, on the other hand, in his book, talks about him as Bartholomew. And if you may or not have heard Beth pointing out earlier, this was probably his surname because Bartholomew means son of Ptolemy. So, son Ptolemy. So, it's thought that Bartholomew may have been his last name, quote. They didn't really have last names then, but they would identify people by their father or some relative. So, Nathaniel, son of Ptolemy, became Nathaniel Bartholomew. So the, the Gospels and Acts only listed in the list. Book of John doesn't do much better. List him twice, or talks about him twice. Once, when he's called, Philip goes and gets him and brings him to Jesus. We'll talk about that in a minute. The other place he's listed in John is after the resurrection. You remember Peter says, I'm going fishing. Nathaniel is one of the ones listed who goes fishing with them. Now, again, 
from the basis of Nathanael's call when Jesus sought him out, or when Philip brought him to Jesus, it's believed, it's inferred, that Bartholomew, Nathanael, had an understanding of the scriptures and understood what was the Messiah's uh, role. Uh, you'll remember when Philip goes to Nathanael and says, we have found the Messiah. Then he tells Nathanael, it's Jesus of Nazareth. Anybody remember what Nathanael's answer was? What can anything good come out of Nazareth? He didn't dispute the scripture readings. He kind of pointed a finger at his hometown where he grew up. Again, I learn a lot of stuff when I'm doing these lessons. Evidently, the place where Philip was from, which is Cana of Galilee, and Nazareth were close together. And some Bible scholars believe that there was some, shall we say, civic rivalry between the two of them. So it's like, that's my rival city. Can anything good come from there? So a little bit maybe of some prejudice coming through. It didn't stop him from accepting Jesus as the Messiah. But he did kind of point a finger at can anything good come out of Nazareth? In John 1, 47, Jesus, when he meets Nathanael, the first thing he says to him is, here is an Israelite without any deceit. The, again, Bible scholars believe and interpret this to mean that Nathanael was one who worshipped God completely without any hypocrisy, which would have been different than the religious authorities who were in it for the power. Without any what? Without any hypocrisy. hypocrisy. In fact, when Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree, again, Bible scholars infer, location wasn't important. What Jesus was saying was, I've seen your heart. And you are fully committed to the worship of God. You're not like the religious authorities. You are have a sincerity of worship, a sincerity of belief. And from that point on, like Philip, Nathaniel was wholly committed to Jesus as the Messiah. So what do we know about Nathaniel from tradition? So again, you've got a, a bio sheet. So under names, Nathaniel is a Hebrew word that means God has given. Nathaniel is a Hebrew word meaning God has given. And Bartholomew and I'll spell Bartholomew for you, B-A-R-T-H-O-L-O-M-E-W, B-A-R-T-H-O-L-O-M-E-W, was probably his surname. As Bartholomew means son of Ptolemy, T-O-L-M-A-I. So probably his surname, or what would accounted for a surname. It gave him a relationship with a relative. Just like James and John are called the sons of Zebedee, Nathaniel was the son of Ptolemy. Would you spell that again for me? Oh, which one? Ptolemy. T-O-L-M-A-I. And he's the son of who? Son of Ptolemy. T-O-L. Yeah, but that, Bartholomew. That's Bartholomew. That's what Bartholomew means. Yeah. Son yeah. of Ptolemy. Okay. Okay, under personal information, John 21 tells us that he was born and raised in Cana of Galilee. C-A-N-A -A of Galilee. And again, John 1 tells us he was well versed in scripture.
under spiritual information, he was skeptical. Again, John 1.46 says, can anything good kind of come out of Nazareth? He was skeptical to begin with. That's under spiritual? That's under spiritual. But he was also honest. Once he met Jesus, he was totally committed to him as the Messiah. And while he was in the background, he was a faithful follower for the three years that he followed Christ. And then lastly, he was in the group who ate breakfast with Jesus after the resurrection. And Peter said, I'm going fishing. Oh, wait a minute, is that historical? Or That's spiritual? spiritual. Okay. I'll tell you when we switch. Okay. We're still in spiritual. Okay. He so was with the group that ate breakfast with Jesus after the resurrection on the beach. Okay, historical. Historical means this is all tradition. We don't know. Tradition says that he ministered in Asia Minor and in India. Remember, Asia Minor is modern-day Turkey. So he ministered in Turkey and in India. The Armenian church, and I'll spell Armenian for you, A-R-M-E-N-I-A-N, A-R-M-E-N-I-A-N. The Armenian church claims him as their founder. And if you're not familiar with Armenia is, Armenia is kind of to the northeast of Turkey, going towards India, up in all the, the stands and stuck on the map. Tradition says that's where he was martyred, in Armenia. In fact, it says he was flayed alive. Oh, God. He was flayed alive. Who killed all these people? People who didn't want to hear their message. And for that reason, his symbol is a knife or a blade. Oh, God. Mine's a drawer. So, again, we've got two disciples here who are kind of in the background. They're only mentioned two or three times in Scripture other than in the lists. But they all ministered widely from Ukraine to Turkey to India. So, I mean, they traveled a lot. So let's go through the, the fill-in-the-blanks. Hopefully you got all the ones for the biography sheets. If not, I'll give you some help with that. But let's look at the... Uh, the fill in the blank sheets. In each listing of the apostle, Philip was always listed fifth at the head of the second group of four apostles. This probably implies that he was the leader, leader of the group. Philip was from the Seda, the same hometown as Philip and Andrew. Peter and Andrew. Oh, God. Not Philip, Peter and Andrew. I thought that was wrong. Philip was from Bethsaida, which is the same hometown as Philip, as you got me doing it, as Peter and Andrew. Number three, all that we know about him comes from the book of John. In most instances, Philip is paired with Nathaniel, so we can assume they're very close friends. From the accounts in John concerning Philip, we see a very practical, by the book, process driven, you know, step by step. However you want to word it, he was a type A. You know, it's got to go one, two, three, four. Based on the account of the feeding of the 5,000 found in John 6, it is possible that Philip filled a logistical role or a supply role. If you were military, I'd call him the quartermaster. Yeah. Five says, Philip is the fourth. fourth disciple called by Jesus after Andrew, Peter, and John. While these three were pointed to Jesus by John the Baptist, Jesus saw out, saw out Philip, went looking oh. for him. Peter. From his immediate response, it is evident that he was well-versed in the scriptures. Yeah. 
and recognized Jesus as the Messiah. We next see Philip at the the feeding of the 5,000 first. After he's called, we next see him at the feeding of the 5,000. John 6, 5 tells us that Jesus asked Philip how they were going to feed the 5,000, feed, feed the crowd. Even though Philip had seen Jesus turn water into wine and perform other miracles, he saw this as an impossible situation. There's no solution to this, Jesus. We don't have the money. We don't have the resources. Philip needed to see that everything was possible mm -hmm. with Jesus. There was no impossibilities. Our last glimpse of Philip is in the upper room. In the upper room. Jesus had just finished telling the disciples that he was returning to heaven. Those who wished to follow him had to have faith in his sacrifice and they would be with him forever. Philip did not understand, so he asked to see the Father. Philip had accepted Jesus as God's Messiah from the beginning. Now he had to accept him as God himself. Is it God himself or God his son? Just, just God would be fine. <clears throat> He had to accept him as part of the Trinity, part of the Godhead, not just the Messiah, not just the human sent, but actually God himself. Number eight, Philip's closest friend is listed as Nathaniel, Nathaniel or Bartholomew. John identifies him as Bartholomew. As Bartholomew. Like Philip, the Synoptic Gospels and Acts only list Nathaniel as part of the listing of the apostles. They tell us nothing about him. John features Nathaniel only... How many times? I don't know. Twice. His calling and when he goes fishing. From Nathaniel's calling, it is obvious that both he and Philip were well-versed in the Scriptures. Number 11, Jesus identifies Nathanael as one Israelite who was without deceit. Without deceit. This is probably best understood to mean that Nathanael worshipped God without any hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Unlike the religious leaders of the day. When Jesus saw him under the fig tree, the location was not as important as his heart being sincere. the condition of his heart. Jesus knew the sincerity of Nathanael's heart. That was enough to convince Nathanael that this was indeed the Messiah. From that point on, Nathanael was totally committed. Okay. Anybody need some help with the bio sheets that you didn't get? We're going to have to look at the bio sheets. We'll look at the film yeah, John, do you have a question? Right. Yes, yeah, on our the times Philip is mentioned in the scripture on the uh, fill in the blanks, it doesn't mention that he's mentioned when the Greeks came to Philip. Yeah. I didn't list them all. Okay, one more. Very good. I try to make it as concise as I can without okay. overloading. We'll watch your movie. You watch my movie, okay. Okay, next week we're going to hit the last four. Maybe. Uh, I got almost 7.30 tonight. So we may end up splitting next week into two. We'll see. Um, again, the last four we don't know a whole heck of a lot about. So we may end up being able to get them all done, or we may just get two and do two later. We'll play it by ear and see what, what happens with the time. Any other questions, comments before we close tonight? No, we want you to have a safe trip yes. to yeah, and from you. Kentucky. Yep. Or Tennessee. Where are you going? Kentucky. <laughs> Lexington. Wherever it is you're going. We Wherever it is over there on that far country. Yeah. Okay, let's close with prayer then. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you for this lesson on these two apostles. While they're not mentioned a lot of times in Scripture, we know from tradition that they spread your message around the known world of that day. Help us to be witnesses like they were witnesses to those around us. Keep us safe now as we travel home. 
Uh, bring us back on Sunday for worship and Wednesday as we again look at your apostles. Corey, ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.